Hi, this is Vince Horn here, and I wanted to talk a little bit about social meditation and really about how all meditation is inherently social because all human beings are inherently social. So I've been teaching explicit meditation techniques for the last several years that myself and others that I've learned them from and I'm teaching them with have called social meditation. And it's really a misnomer in a certain way because all meditation already is inherently social. In fact, I'd go so far just as to say there are some kinds of meditations which are inherently social, but which emphasize um, one's own personal experience so that they're more anti-social meditations. But even being anti-social um, is still, there's no way around the fact that we are human beings and that the nature of our organism is to be in relationship to one another. So if you think about even the most antisocial forms of meditation, um, which I've practiced, you have things like the silent retreat model. So where you go somewhere and you are sitting silently, observing, focusing, inquiring, cultivating different aspects of your own experience, but you're doing so in silence with others. So just the very fact that there are other people there immediately means that it is already social. There are certain social norms and so social rules that are built into the retreat experience. Um, in some of the early retreats I did, there were rules around who could enter and exit the, the meditation hall uh, at what times. Uh, during the end of a meditation, it was uh, a social norm. It wasn't written anywhere. It was just understood by observing everyone's behavior that the teachers, whoever was sitting in front of the room, that they left first before anyone else could leave. I then went to another retreat center on the West Coast teaching the same style of meditation and that social norm was different. And it really wasn't just that it was different when people exited, there was a, that difference represented entire invisible social structures, uh, certain kinds of hierarchies or lacks, lack of hierarchy. And that changed the very essence and spirit of the environment itself, even when there was no talking. Um, take even the most extreme antisocial form of meditation possible, the self-retreat. When someone goes off on their own to be by themselves, no one around, meditating uh, in isolation and often in silence. Even the most extreme version of the self-retreat, even if you imagine, and this happens even to this day in places like Tibet and India, where someone would go off on self-retreat and they vow to be on self-retreat until the day they die having no contact with the outside world only investigating being mindful of practicing with their own experience even that person is practicing socially and the reason i say this is because that person wasn't just born on self-retreat every one of us was born in the care of others learned from others, received instructions, support, encouragement, trauma, all of that from other people. And no matter, uh, even if this is the most extreme example of the, of, the, of the monk or the yogi going off on self-retreat until they die, that person will bring all of that interactivity, all of that knowing, all of that knowledge that's been passed down and through them into the retreat. They can't help but bring that full social relational matrix that's making up them up into this environment. And then if they leave any artifacts behind, if they leave any writings or journal entries or anything that they want to share with the world or that other people will then pick up and read, that social relational um, connection continues. So we are social beings. We are relational. We're made up of our relationships. This whole idea of the heroic individual, the mythology that sprung up out of the Western Enlightenment and out of the emphasis on reason and individual rights, that myth is already dead. It's just the institutions and the traditions that have grown up around it that um, take time to dwindle and to pass away. And I would count most of Western Buddhist institutions as being still involved in perpetuating that myth in some way. And so we've got to build better institutions. We've got to build better 
uh, models of instruction. We've got to build better practice communities that start to take into account the more relational um, and intersubjective nature of who we are as, in, as beings. Um, why this is important? I think this is really important because in exploring these different social meditation techniques and teaching them and practicing them now for years, what I've started to notice is that people begin to see things that previously had gone undisclosed in their meditation. People start to notice how social conditioning is playing out in their experience, not just in how their own personal conditioning, but in the, the ways that they respond to others or withhold or edit themselves in real time or say things in order to sound intelligent or wise or compassionate or whatever. Like all of that conditioning really can only become clearly known when it's done with other people and, and often, and I think it needs to be done out loud. So um, that's why I think this is important. We've got to retool and redesign our meditation techniques to bring them to bear on the intersubjective nature of our experience. When we don't do that, we leave these whole aspects of our experience unexplored, unexamined, undisclosed um, to awareness. And as a result, the things in us that are unexamined, that are undisclosed, that are unseen, those are the things that often uh, drive us, that we're subject to. So if meditation practice, one of its core goals is to bring into the light of awareness that which is occurring. If that's one of its main goals, to liberate the contents of experience in awareness, then we can't do that unless we turn our awareness toward all that that is happening. Everything that makes up the subjective experience, which is the only way as living beings we know reality. It's only through our sensory perception and through the thinking mind that we know experience. So it makes sense that we would use our meditative techniques and technologies to turn toward all of these different use cases, all these different ways that we are with each other. And the fact that meditation, uh, modern meditation has really failed to do that is a result or a function of the hidden philosophy behind modernity, that we are these individuals who are reasoning our way through life and who are isolated and alone, and yet we can connect with these other individuals. That's just not such an accurate or helpful paradigm anymore, given what we've learned in the last few hundred years since the Western Enlightenment, and given what we've learned and incorporated from things like the Eastern Enlightenments. Um, there's a much broader and bigger picture of what it means to be alive, and um, bringing meditation to bear on that means explicitly exploring the intersubjective and the systemic level of experience, the level at which systems are created and crafted and processes are created and crafted and agreed on. Um, that's another area that meditation is largely um, uh, left alone, uh, was simply unaware of in the early history of meditation, but now it's um, a question really of ignorance. So here we are uh, practicing social meditation, whether we want to or not. So it sure makes sense to me to practice it uh, better to bring the light of awareness onto and into everything which is arising, so much of which is arising uh, in relation to other things. I'd say actually everything is arising in relation to everything else. That was the very definition um, that the Mahayana Buddhists gave to the most important realization, uh, of the realization of emptiness, that everything is interdependent, interconnected. So let's realize that again. Uh, in new ways in this world so that we can um, really heal at a deeper level, uh, heal not just our personal pains and wounding, which are all intersubjective, but also to heal the pains and wounding of the very collective uh, level of, of all beings. Um, because if we can't really um, bring awareness into the world, where it actually makes a real difference, to where it actually heals, where it changes, where it transforms the very material conditions of our reality, then there really is nothing in meditation that's, that's useful.